the first book in your Bible mentions the book in the Old Testament, but also coincidentally in your New Testament, it also mentions about the book. But there's a difference with these two books and you're going to observe it. Now, uh, in this passage, let me quickly explain it. The book of the generations of Adam. So, in other words, this book is going to be about the generations that's given from Adam's lineage. So Adam's lineage and his generation is about to be given from this book, but there's another book in comparison. All right, Matthew 1, Matthew 1. Keep your hand at Genesis 5, because we're always going to go back there. Remember again, from the Old Testament and the New Testament, starts out coincidentally. The starting points in your both testaments has the book of the generation. Why? Because there's a distinguishing. There's a difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Old generation and then the new generation. Your old creature, your old life, your new creature and your new life. You could see a very good sermon out of this. Matthew chapter 1 verse 1. The book of the generation. Not Adam this time. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ. There's a distinguishing between Adam and Jesus. Now, throughout your entire Bible, there's too many uh, distinguishings between uh, Adam and Jesus. We're going to look at Romans 6, for example. Go to Romans 5, excuse me. Romans 5. Throughout your Bible, there's always a contrast between Adam and Jesus. Adam and Jesus. Why? Because we know about Adam. Throughout Adam's generation, everyone died. Everyone uh, ended uh, because of his choice of sin. But with Jesus Christ, through his death, we received life eternal instead. Amen. That's a huge blessing. We receive life eternal from Jesus Christ's death. But then from Adam's death, everyone obviously received death in return. Now, let's look at Romans uh, chapter 5. Look at this contrast here about death from Adam, but life from Jesus Christ. We'll start off with verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man, that's Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Look at verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God, and the gift of by grace, which is, one, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. If you look at verse 12, notice that because of Adam's sin, and verse 14, everyone received death. But the opposite is also true, where everyone who gets Jesus Christ from what he did, he makes a comeback by giving us life eternal. So contrasting Adam. Look at the contrast constantly with negative, positive. Negative from Adam, positive from Jesus. The Bible says in verse 16, And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. Sin versus the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. We see offenses versus justification. We see condemnation versus free gift. And by the way, notice the Bible says free gift. Yeah. So that means that we receive salvation as a free gift. The Bible shows at verse 17, For if by one man's offense death reign by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. If you look at one man's offense, death reigned at verse 17. But much more so by one Jesus Christ we receive grace uh, and the gift of righteousness. Verse 18, Therefore as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Look, one, uh, sin is that strong and powerful. And you're going to hear a little bit about that during main service today. 
But just by one person's sin, the offense and one judgment came upon and affected the entire human race. And then you'll notice that the latter part, but it's the same thing with the free gift. By one man came a free gift upon everybody. So that's something that we can rejoice. So we see a contrast between the generations of Jesus Christ and Adam. What are the generations and the difference? The generation of death versus the generation of life. Why? One generation, it's all a physical line here. Jesus Christ, when He gives life, obviously it's not physical. We know that's spiritual. We know that everything wrong that Adam did, that all has to do within, uh, not just spiritually, but more so the Romans 5, what you're noticing, it's all physical. What we're suffering in this physical earth. But then the opposite is true with Jesus Christ. Alright, we're going to look at, uh, let's see here. We see a difference with uh, Adam and Jesus, with uh, death versus life. And we look at John chapter 3. That would be appropriate. Let's look at John chapter 3. I'm going to look at John chapter 3. All right. Now, in John chapter 3, Jesus Christ, he talks about something that's very important for all of us. Generations, right? Generations of Adam and Jesus. But within these generations of Adam and Jesus that the book covers, how does a generation come to existence from birth. So generate, right? Similar to birth. Look what Jesus talks about that. He verses Adam and himself. John chapter 3 and verse 3, the famous verse. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That confused Nicodemus because at verse 4 he's saying, well, how does a man get born and re uh, does he return to his mother's womb and come out again? See, Nicodemus was only focusing the physical birth. Jesus knew it was a given. There is a physical birth. That's why that's the first birth. So he was talking about a different birth besides a physical birth. You'll notice at verse... Five, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water. Isn't that our fleshly physical birth? They say that her water broke, right? So why? Birth is about to take place. And of the Spirit. See that? So you have two births. The Spirit, Jesus answered. That's what born again means. Verse 6 is self-explanatory. Gives the answer. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. See, first verse... First birth versus second birth. Verse 7, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. So we see that Jesus Christ, he says, that's why, don't be surprised when I tell you, you have to be born again. All right, return to Genesis 5, please. All right, return to Genesis chapter 5. So notice that uh, you do get born again through Jesus Christ, his generation. But through Adam, we do not receive that. So instead, it's all death. All right, we look at verse 2. Verse 2, uh, no, excuse me, uh, I didn't finish verse 1. Let me finish verse 1. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Okay, what that means is that at that particular day that God created Adam, it was at that same time God created Adam according to his likeness. So God made sure that Adam would be created in his likeness, uh, in similitude, in his image. That's the other word. But that is at the day that God created Adam. But uh, we'll expound that a little bit more a little bit later on what I mean. Okay, so I'll, I'll explain that later on what I mean by that because uh, there's something going on that's a difference. All right, let's jump to verse 2, though. Male and female created he them and blessed them. Now, notice that's separated. Notice that the first part, at Genesis 5.1, man is created in the image of God. But the woman is not included. The woman is mentioned at verse 2. Male and female created he them. Now he's talking about 
In totality, he created man and woman. He didn't put woman in the image of God. So that's a misunderstanding that a lot of people have. A uh, woman is not actually in the image of God. A woman is in the image of man. Amen. So hence you have, uh, that's why Adam said, she shall be called woman. Why? Because she was taken out of man. Amen. That's what Adam said at Genesis chapter 2. So we see here that at Genesis 5 verse 2 that a woman, she is not created in the image of God but rather in the image of man. Why? Because she, as Adam mentioned, she was taken out of man. Uh, but keep reading, it's explanatory here. And blessed them. So God blessed man and woman when he created them and called, look at this, their name Adam in the day they were created. So God said that both of their names are Adam at that day when they were created by him. So that's the reason why in marriage ceremonies it's going to be, oh, now I can see why we would take the last name from the husband. Why? Because it comes from a tradition. It comes from a line of thinking. And where does tradition get that from? There's an original source somewhere. The original source is Genesis 5.2. So that's been common, is that the woman is after the image of man. Now, I explained that at our Genesis 1 study, but I'm going to just do it very briefly here. Go to 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So Genesis 5.2 is the evidence... And then 1 Corinthians 11 is the next evidence. Notice here that man is the glory, the image, the likeness of God. Whereas woman, she takes the glory of the man instead. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Look at verse 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And then uh, we'll read verse 7. Okay, so look at what the passage reads. The Bible says, For if a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the what? Image. image and glory of God. See, man is in the image and glory of God. Woman is different, but the woman, look at this, is the glory of the man. So we see here that woman is after the image of man instead. Okay, let's go to uh, back to Genesis 5, please. We'll return to Genesis chapter 5. So, mankind is in the likeness and the image of God. A woman, she is different. She is from the man. So, I'm going to add this one to give a distinction. Alright, let's look at Genesis chapter 5 again. Let's uh, finish off verse 2 and then get down to verse 3. The Bible says, and Adam lived in 130 years. So Adam lived 130 years. So he lived a long time and begat a son in his own likeness. You notice that there when he gave birth to a son, the son takes after Adam's image. Look at this. Begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. So one of the people who came from Adam's genealogy... We're going to, I'm going to write them all down here. That way you can see the distinctions of the names. So the first one from Adam we see is Seth. But Seth, notice, he takes after Adam's image. And that's what you're going to find out from Adam's line. Let me put it this way. From Adam's line, everybody is going to take his image now from henceforth from Adam. Notice it didn't say that Seth was in the image of God. Did you notice that there? It said he was in the image of Adam. Why? Because we lost our image of God. Because Genesis chapter 1, Adam, he had the image of God. But because of his sinful state when he made the decision to sin, he lost the image of God. So there's no doubt there was a transformation in Adam's body, obviously. He was going to die. And then he doesn't have an eternal state of salvation. He lost, uh, he became a fallen state. Everything changed in the physical plane, in the physical universe. So because of that, there is no doubt that uh, th there's, a dis there's a change to Adam's image now. See that? 
So because there's a change to Adam's image, and all of us take Adam's image, not God's image. So uh, there's, a mis uh, there's a mistaken teaching. People will say that we're all the image of God, but that's not true. We all actually take the image of Adam. Now there are several verses to prove this. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And I want your other hand to go to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, what you're going to notice about this church is that we look at the scriptures. Uh, why? Because uh, I could be telling you something wrong right now. So you need to check me out in the Bible. So the book should be your final authority, not me. Alright, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and then we'll read verse 4. 2 Corinthians 4, 4. This is talking about in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Well, that's pretty obvious. Uh, that's referring to Satan. So he blinded everybody. So look at this line. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the what? Image. image of God. So Christ has the image of God. Through his gospel of salvation, you have the image of God. But look at this. Should shine unto them. Okay, read that again. Uh, the second part of verse 4. Lest the light, gospel, that's from the image of God, would what? Shine, be given to the lost world. See, they're distinguished from the image of God. You notice that the lost, unbelieving world, they're, they're, they're distinguished. They're separated from the image of God. You notice here that to get the image of God then, to restore it, is through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You need the gospel. You need Jesus Christ. People say, that I don't, I'll do it my way to go to heaven. Then you are not in the image of God, and then you lost it. And you need the gospel so that you can get back the image of God once more. It's the gospel that saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, He died, buried, and resurrected for Amen. you, will you receive it so that you can get your image again? Amen. Amen. All right, 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. You'll notice here that there's a, distinct, uh, there's a distinction with uh, Adam's image and Christ's image. There's always a distinction. We'll see at 1 Corinthians chapter 15... And then we'll read verse 46. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. And after that which is spiritual. Okay, there's this distinction between a natural person and a spiritual person. Uh, you hear about the teaching of naturalism or natural science, etc. The reason why they will say naturalism is because it's supposed to talk about our physical realm that we're in. So that's what science is concentrated on, obviously, right? So we're talking, uh, so the Bible knows when it says natural. It's talking about like naturalism. So there's a distinguish, uh, there's a distinction between the spirit world and naturalism. Uh, verse 47, the first man is of the earth earthy. Well, that's pretty apparent. That's referring to Adam here. So he's within the plane of naturalism, the earthy realm. The second man is the what? Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as such is the heavenly, such as also are they that are heavenly. Well, there's a distinction again with earthly image and heavenly image. Well, it's pretty obvious who's the heavenly image. That's from God. That's Jesus Christ. Remember the distinction? Adam versus Jesus. There's clearly no doubt about that when you read the Bible. There's always the distinguishing, Amen. the distinction between those two. Now, if it's referring to Adam and Jesus, the distinction. Look at this. This is eye-opening here, uh, eye here. Verse 49. And as we have borne the image of the what? Earthy. So we're born from Adam's image. Not Christ's image, God's image. Because look at the distinction. We shall also... Bear the image of the heavenly. See? So that's a future tense to say believers when we die and go to heaven. But lost people obviously don't go to heaven. So they do not have the image of God. So there's no doubt about that. So when people say that we're all created in the image of God, uh, they don't know their Bible. Because the reason why is mankind takes such pride in humanity. 
in naturalism, humanism, mankind in general. Right. And then they'll try to mix up God as a part of that when God has zero part in that. But remember which civilization likes to put God, God within their humanism. Don't forget Genesis 4, Cain's civilization. Yeah. Yeah. All right, And you're going to see in Genesis 5 some of these people's names. They take it with pride after Cain's civilization and mingle it with God. You're going to find that out. Alright, uh, we saw evidence of that at Genesis 4.24, right? And then uh, Cain's uh, living on how he worshipped his God, etc. Alright, let's go to Genesis 5. Not much difference, right, with Genesis 4 and 5 with today's world. Mankind never learned their lesson. It's so amazing. Within less than 100 years, less than 100 years, mankind thinks that they're smarter than 19 years of cumulative history. You got 1,900 years, if not longer than that, of evidence of mankind repeating a cycle. What makes you think, proud know-it-all you, that you're better? You know, if I told you 10 years ago that, you know, science is so uh, low compared to God. God knows how fallible man is. You have such faith in your science. I'm going to tell you something, that one day there's going to come a time that despite of your advancement of technology, you're all going to be scrounging for toilet paper. You guys would laugh at me until last year. Until last year. Wow, how great our science is. Toilet paper. Crying out loud. Toilet paper. 1500s, they could scrounge around for paper to wipe their bum better than you did. Now you see how advanced science is and mankind is? You're not so great after all. God, God, God's not stupid. You, I, I mean, scientists. If you're a scientist and you're a serious scientist, they even admit that they have to bow to the realm of science on how unfathomable and how much more they have to learn. It's unpredictable, a lot of things. There's a lot of things they can predict now because they discovered, but they know that they only scratched the surface. My. Coronavirus was evidence of that one. And then the people all just scrounged around. Wow. Okay. Let's look at Genesis 5. Let's look at Genesis 5. You know what? Uh, I just have to park it right here a little bit more. You know what their greatest... I mean, before, before, uh, before the p scientists came out finally with their vaccines and etc. You know what the greatest advancement of technology and science is to save us from this virus? Put a diaper around your face. <laughs> wow! Spectacular! You're telling me that? Wow! See that? I mean, you, if you're, you've got to be blind as a bat to take such faith in naturalism and scientism. It, that's a term. I don't know if you even knew that. Wow. It's, so, it, it's actually more religion than faith when you use that term. But I'm not going to get over there, okay? So I'm not going to uh, I'm not gonna get into the philosophical arguments and scientific arguments on that one. That's a whole other story. Okay, uh, let's look at Genesis chapter 5. Let's look at Genesis chapter 5. All right, now let's look at the brilliance of uh, technology, science, humanism, and look at how it follows today. Okay, and look at how they follow Cain. There's no doubt about that. Verse 4, And the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were 800 years. So, the, during the days and the life of Adam... After he gave birth to Seth, he lived 800 years. So that's a long time. And he begat sons and daughters. So obviously, he gave birth to children. Now, what the explanation to why they were able to live such a long time, let's go back to Genesis 2. Let's look back at Genesis 2. The atmosphere and the environment is different. The atmosphere and the environment is different. There's absolutely no doubt, and this is basic science too, is that when you have a positive environment, it impacts your health. And then when you have a positive uh, environment and setting, and there are some people who can live past 100 because they're in a more better condition, actually. They're in more better condition. And not only that, they're not as uh, in a sickly environment or a lack of uh, civilized environment. Uh, back in the Dark Ages, it was pretty bad. They were like dying like flies, actually. But then, ma mankind, they were able to advance in their technology and civilization to extend the years longer. And that's the explanation here. 
is that in Genesis 5, you got an advancement of technology and civilization. There's no doubt at Genesis 4 we study that. And then at uh, Genesis 2, what you're going to look at is a positive environment and atmosphere. That's why they were able to live that long. Okay, so let's look at Genesis chapter 2. Genesis 2. Notice that the Bible says at verse 5, And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth. Look at that. See, He didn't cause it to rain. And there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. So notice that that's how uh, mankind was able to live. It was from the ground. So then if it comes from below, their health stability and their proximity toward uh, humidity and water, and all life comes from water, obviously, it keeps them going and refreshed. Sometimes, I don't know if you've... Uh, they say swimming is a good... Uh, treatment when a lot of people tried all sorts of medications actually. Why? Because water, it does something with your body. Uh, I know for my case is that uh, if I have uh, so many stressful things going on in the church, I just take a nice long shower <laughs> and it does something. It's kind of weird. The, something weird there. Alright, Genesis 5. Genesis 5. Genesis 5. Alright, on that weird note, let's talk serious <laughs> scripture. Serious scripture. Okay then. Alright. <laughs> So, that gives the explanation to why they were able to live long. So, remember those two factors. It's an advancement of civilization and technology. And that's pretty evident when you study throughout history. So, that's how they can extend the years. But then also, at the same time, they were able to have a positive environment. But you notice that these people lived 800 years. So, this is evidence then. That the ancients, they had an advancement of technology that today's people did not have. Now, there's absolutely no doubt about it, because people are still, uh, it boggles the mind of both scientists and historians and archaeologists how the pyramids were built, for example, right? So then, it always boggled their minds, and then they always uh, wondered about the huge structures, and then they always were in amazement of how uh, they designed and carved these figures. Um, if you look at the lines in Peru, they designed the lines in a way where it would, uh, without any technology whatsoever, and if you have an aerial view, it just, the picture just matched perfectly. And those things can go like uh, thousands of feet, uh, if not miles long. So it's incredible how these people did it. So there is absolutely no doubt they had a technology and civilization that's different from ours. Now, it might be primitive in our opinion. It's not like they have uh, electronics and then internet and a digital age, etc. But there's no doubt they have an advancement of technology that's different from ours. And that's evident throughout history. And if, you're, if you study these people who studied these ancient uh, artifacts and just made these discoveries, they'll mention that these people had a genius, a brilliance that was different from ours back then. So there is no doubt. They had an advancement of technology then where they kind of figured out or knew where they could live longer and they live more healthy. Now let's look at Genesis 5. With the positive environment combined. With the positive environment combined. So then, uh, this uh, green uh, color right here could be some kind of resource. It's also possible they had a resource that time before the flood uh, destroyed everything. Sometimes you have to think about that too. They had a resource that time that could be different before the flood destroyed everything. So this represents a technology and a civilization that's advanced, yet different from ours. Let's look at Genesis chapter 5. And then uh, we read verse 5. And all the days that Adam lived, so all the timeline, the days that Adam lived, were 930 years, and he died. So Adam was able to live 930 years, and then he finally passed away. Now, here's something that's amazing, is that some people, they talk about, what about the heathen who never heard the gospel? Uh, a lot of people don't know the truth that time. Why is God so mean to drown out everybody with the worldwide flood? But you got to understand this. Adam, you know how far away he was from Noah? He was less than 30 years away from Noah. So, guess what? Mankind knew Adam. Adam walked among, among them, and they heard everything that they needed to know. 
Well, what's the problem? No, same thing today. You, do, 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 do your children listen to you, parents? <laughs> Good luck with that. Give it about hundreds of years. Hundreds of years. Hundreds of years. I mean, within less than 30 years, especially when you had advanced technology, it became even more scary. They changed culture, ideals, changed immensely within less than 10 to 30 years when advanced technology and social media came out. It's scary. But imagine with their advancement of technology, and not only that, they had the original source with them that time. It's, it's, it's really fast. It's really fast. So we see here from a 30-year away time span from Noah. So if you start doing the calculations yourself, you'll notice that it's not far away. I could be wrong about uh, the numbers, but I do know this. It's uh, not far away. And I was able to somehow get less than 30 years. So you just uh, look at Genesis 5 yourself, and then you do the homework yourself, and then you'll kind of figure it out. Because the Bible will tell you at, uh, at what age the latter generation gave birth to somebody else. So if you, uh, time, uh, if you calculate and add it with that one, plus the timeline that they died, and the timeline where they gave birth to children, then it'll be helpful where you can make the calculations. Uh, there are several places that you can go to for charts concerning about the timelines that show from Adam to Noah. A lot of people want to see a clear time span of that. And then me, I'm not, a, I'm not that smart to give you a time span of that one with everybody's name. So, uh, and I don't have time to do that here, obviously. So my advice would be, there's uh, two places that you can go to is Usher's. And uh, Usher is the standard for biblical uh, timelines. So you can look at James Usher. And then the other one is Bullinger's Companion Bible. Bullinger did a pretty uh, good job on that one. But not only that, nowadays, uh, you can just simply Google it's that simple now. So from what I discovered, it's not too far off. I'm sure a lot of them are different from each other, but it's not too far off. All right, let's look back at Genesis 5. Let's look at Genesis 5. So Adam died. Now notice that uh, natural death, the first natural death, the other one was an unnatural death, right? We studied that one. The other one was an unnatural death. The Lord didn't intend it that way. Cain violated. So that's the reason why Cain was punished. Natural death here is the first natural death is given. Adam. And notice the number. The number is 5. Genesis 5, 5. So uh, here is biblical numerology that some of you didn't know about before. Or some of you do know as well. But the number, number 5 in the Bible, represents death. It represents death. Right. Now, if you look throughout the scriptures, there's uh, no doubt about it that number five has connotations with death. If you look at uh, current people's uh, thinking and beliefs, five is associated quite often. Now, what you're going to hear from the churches is that they'll claim that five is the number of grace. G-R-A-C-E. However, D-E-A-T-H also fits. Now, another thing is this, is that the reason why they say it's grace, the reason why they say it's grace is because of Jesus. When He died, He gave grace to all mankind. But I just gave away the answer there. Yes, through His death, we received grace. Amen. They mention about uh, the five imprints, right? One, two, his two hands, his two feet, and the one on his side, right? So it's supposed to represent uh, wounds of grace. That's true, but uh, the reason why he got five is because he had to die to begin with, to give grace to all of mankind. Amen. So death is the number of five. Now, I'm going to give you several examples here. There are several examples. The first one is Genesis 5.5. 5, and my encouragement is to look up the word, the number five in the Bible. Now, obviously, not all the time will you see five and automatically someone dies, you know. It's not like I have five people in church and then just expect someone to die one day, all right? So it's not like that, okay? But the point is, is that in the Bible, you're going to see quite often when uh, five is mentioned, it'll somehow connect to death more than any other element. Uh, we're going to look at the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. 
So we talk about the five bleeding wounds of Christ. Uh, let's look at 2 Samuel 2. 2 Samuel 2, excuse me. We're not going to look at 1 Samuel. Because uh, if you look at 1 Samuel, uh, the Bible talks about that David, when he went to kill Goliath, how many stones did he pick out? Five smooth stones. Five smooth stones. So why? Because that's a number, uh, that's a number representing death. You'll notice Romans chapter 5, that uh, the passage we read was about what? Death. It was about Adam and death. If you look at Acts 5.5, 5, somebody suddenly dies, which is pretty strange. So there's a lot. Uh, you hear about people when they're about to crash and they go, Mayday, 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 May, right? Uh, but then why? Because uh, May is your fifth month right there. But another example is 2 Samuel chapter 2. 2 Samuel chapter 2. You can find a lot of interesting connections when you think about the number 5. Uh, another example, excuse me, is that Satan, the Bible says, has the power of death. All right? So then, S-A-T-A-N. All right? And then, is devil 2? D-E-V-I-L. Yeah, see that? So all of that matches with death. Why? Because the Bible says a Hebrew, Satan is the power of death. That's why Jesus Christ had to take the keys of death away from right. Satan. Yeah. All right, Second Samuel chapter yeah. 2. Why did, doesn't now make sense why Jesus had to conquer death? Yeah. Because from Adam he gave death. Mm -hmm. So Jesus had to give five bleeding wounds. Thank you, Lord. Jesus Christ had to match up death so that he can take away the keys from the power of death Amen. itself. All right, let's look at Second Samuel uh, chapter 2. How do people die? Notice which number of the rib. The Bible says at verse 23, Howbeit he refused to turn aside, wherefore Abner with the hinder end of the spear smote him under the, what number? Fifth rib. Fifth rib that the spear came out behind him and he fell down there and died. Coincidence? Very next chapter. Go to very next chapter. Alright, look at the coincidence here. Very next chapter. Notice that the Bible says that 2 Samuel chapter 3, and notice where they killed this person. That's 2 Samuel chapter 3, and then verse, let's see here, cha 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 cha. Oh, 27, thank you. 27. And when Abner was returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him quietly. And smote him there under the what? Fifth, fifth. Again, fifth rib. Then he died. Coincidence? Very next chapter again. Very next chapter again. Chapter 4, verse 6. Verse 6. And they came thither into the midst of the house as though they would have fetched wheat. And they smote him under where? Fifth rib. Coincidence? Jump to chapter 20. Same book. Chapter 20. Same book. Chapter 20, same book. Notice at verse 10. Verse 10. 2 Samuel chapter 20, verse 10. But Amasa took no heed to the sword. That was in Joab's hand. So he smote him there within the where? Fifth rib. And shed out his bowels to the ground and struck him not again, and he died. How about that? How about that? So five is clearly the number of death. Law first mentioned in biblical hermeneutics as well. So Genesis 5.5. 5. So you can see the first mention of a natural death connected with the number. Alright, go back. Go back. Go back. And then we'll look at verse 6. Verse 6. And Seth lived 105 years. So Seth lived about 105 years and begat Enos. So he gave birth to a son named Enos. Now I showed you at Genesis chapter 4 how very similar that was to Cain's son. You notice that? So I showed you how very similar that was to Cain's son. Now it could be two possibilities. One is that the reason why is because he knew that Cain gave birth to a son named Enoch. So then Seth, when he gave birth to a son named Enos, he was trying to start out something new. That would distinguish their civilization and their people from Cain. There's absolutely no doubt that 
Cain civilization and people and culture, they were kicked out by Adam civilization and culture. That they had to make a separation. That was evident at Genesis 4. Remember, Cain said that everyone who finds me will kill me. So there's no doubt that Cain was considered an outcast from God's mainstream society that he did with Adam's line. So it could, that's possibility one. But possibility two, which can be very possible, is that as I keep reading Genesis 5, I notice how much mankind here is compromising with Cain's system. So it could be that because Cain named his son Enoch, mankind want to follow the ways of the world. Are you listening, Christians? They want to follow the ways of the world because the world's ways look better. And I'm going to raise my child and name my child and uh, put my child in a way that's similar to Cain's ways. Why? Because I, his technology and civilization looks very nice. His religion and worldview looks very appealing. How about that? How about that? Remember, All right. Let's go back, but look at this compromise. There's no doubt. There's a compromise going on. And be, uh, the last part of verse 7, uh, but let me read the whole thing. And Seth lived after he begat Enos 807 years. So after he gave birth to Enos, then he lived 807 years. And then he gave birth to sons and daughters. And all the days of Seth were 912 years. And he died. So Seth lived up to 912 and then he died. So that's what mankind inherited from Adam, is death. Romans 5.12 again, as I read to you before. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Let's look at verse 9. And Enos lived 90 years. And begat Canaan. So then Enos, he lived about 90 years, and then he gave birth to a son named Canaan. Now look at that. C-A-I-N, Cain, and then Un. You notice that there? So you know what he was doing? He was trying to borrow from Cain. Now that becomes very clear. This one, we may not be too sure, but the next one is pretty certain. He did borrow it from Cain. So notice now a compromise was going on where Adam's civilization was now compromising with the world and joining with their system. So then Adam, he, uh, despite of the way that he raised his children and gave them the gospel, are you listening now? Yeah, you millennials need to listen to this because I'm a millennial. Is that when the older generations talked about Jesus or God and something like that, then what happened is, is that the latter generations later on, what happened is that they departed from the faith and then they saw something more attractable to the outside world over there. And then what happens is when they have children, then they become even more worldly. And then the children become uh, more far down, more distance away from Christianity than you. Yes, guarantee. I guarantee. I guarantee. Unless there's a huge life-changing thing when they can get back with the Lord. Or they're willing to make the free choice to get back to the Lord. But it's a natural thing. Is that the natural thing is when you get into the world, one step into the world, your children are going to step three steps more. That's why I stress so much about attending a Bible-believing church. And then reading your Bible, praying and getting saved. If you do that, that's your only hope to get away from the world. But if you haven't been to a Bible-believing church for a while, and I'm not talking about a worldly church. You notice I said worldly church, right? See, that's a church that compromises with the world. It's a church that compromises with the world. A lot of people, and there's a lot of problems that happen in worldly churches too, obviously. So, you can't look at the worldly church... Uh, as uh, your example, you got to attend a Bible-believing church that can show you what's wrong with the ways of the world, what to distance from the ways of the world. Not a preacher who never tells you what to abstain from the world and just says nice things out of the pulpit. And then that's why you wonder why these families lose their children once they enter college. You know why? Pastor never trained them to begin with. Gave them the word to begin, them, begin with. Never armed them to begin with. They just thought Jesus, God's a nice thing. And then when they go to liberal universities, they find problems with Christianity. And then they doubt the existence of God. And then now they become bitter at God when suffering happens because all they heard was nice things about God and nice things about the Christian life. You know what reality is? It's not nice things. 
It's sin throughout the whole world. And then we, uh, all we can do in the sin of Festa's world is never be delivered from it except that when we die and go to heaven. Amen. It's a consequence of mankind's choices. Mankind's choices is what we end up with today. Yeah. Right. All right. Let's go back to Genesis 5. Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5. Okay. Uh, verse 7. And Seth lived after he begat Enos 870 years and begat sons and daughters. I read that. Uh, verse 8, I read that. Verse 9, And Enos lived 90 years and begat Canaan. So I read that. And verse 10, And Enos lived after he begat Canaan 815 years and begat sons and daughters. So after he gave birth to Canaan, lived 815 years, gave birth to sons and daughters. And all the days of Enos were 905 years and he died. So all the days that Enos lived were about 905 years and then he finally died. Verse 12, And Canaan lived 70 years and begat Mahal, uh, Mahalalil. So, I think I pronounced that right. Mahalalil. So, Canaan, self-explanatory, he lived about 70 years, gave birth to a son named Mahalalil. Now, isn't this funny now? Alright, you see this following Cain civilization and today's society. He named his son... Uh, I'm going to write it here because there's no space. Mahalalil. But what this means now is praise of God. So now they want to put God's name in their name. So this is like the first mention you're going to find here. It's the first mention where a person wants to put God's name, uh, to put God with their name. So we see now God is combined with, look at this, God is now combined with... Remember Genesis 4? I told you so. Remember Genesis 4? I taught you. Mm -hmm. Cain wanted to make sure that his civilization and his religion and his belief is something that God would approve of. And that was pretty evident when we read Genesis 4.24 and then when God put the curse on Cain, right? Yeah. Is that different from today? They want to pretend that they... They want to tolerate all religions and try to uh, blind you thinking God is on their side when He is not. And people who are quoting from the Scriptures the Word of God that's contrary to the mainstream world, they want to say they're not on God's side. See what they're doing? They're like Cain. They're trying to make God on their side. Alright. But you got to look at the Scriptures. How do you know what God teaches? How do you really know what God wants? except your abstract belief that you can pick and choose whatever you want. See, you need what God says from His book. Because God will tell you which is right, which is wrong. And guess what? A lot of times what God says is contrary to what you would believe and what you would want. Right. You know why? Because God says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Alright. And, you, you know, you better thank the Lord for that, like some people say. You know what would happen if God was like your thinking and your beliefs? You live in a sad world. You live in a tragic world. I don't know if you ever lived, but you ever thought that you had a good plan, but you thank, uh, but you thank God that your plan didn't go through? Because it would have been something worse. And if you never experienced that, then uh, you have not tasted the Lord. Probably you need to get saved. You need to taste the Lord. You need to see. Amen. But I'm pretty certain, I'm pretty certain, there are people here, Every person here has tasted something in their life that they thought it was a very good idea, but they were very grateful they didn't go through that because it would have been a worse situation, a worse outcome. Amen. See, if God thought like you did, then you, we'd all be in trouble right now. Right, right. All right, let's go to Genesis 5. Genesis 5. Well, we'll read verse 13. And Canaan lived after he begat... Mahalalil, 840 years, and begat sons and daughters. Alright, that's self-explanatory. Canaan lived after he gave birth to Mahalalil, 840 years combined, and gave birth to sons and daughters. Uh, you'll notice that I'll always explain every word in the verse when I'm teaching. The reason why is this is that a lot of people sometimes will say, the Bible is too hard to understand, but I'm trying to show you that as I keep doing that, yeah. That you're going to soon realize, look, it's actually self-explanatory, you know. So even if you get sick and tired after I explain, just pay attention to how I explain it. That way you can drill and convince your fleshly mind that, oh, you know, actually I can do it. I can read it. Amen. I can read a King James Bible. Amen, I was fooled thinking that it was so archaic that I can never understand it. Amen. 
you know, uh, let's look at verse mm, 17 now, right? I think I'm at 17. All right. Or, oh, I forgot what verse. What verse am I at? 14. Yeah. 14, thank you. 14. All right. Now let's look at verse 15. And Mahalalil lived 60 and 5 years and begat Jared. So notice here that Mahalalil, he lived about 60 and 5 years and gave birth to a son that is far worse than him now. You know, that's, so that's pretty bad. You don't want to name your child that. I'm, I'm telling you, okay? I'm telling you. The world just gets worse and worse as they compromise, all right? He might play poker one day too, so you got to make sure that the child doesn't mess up and sin in the world. All right, now... Uh, some of you will catch that. Just, uh, just ask everybody's name and you'll find out, all right? All right, anyway, returning back. Am I at verse 16, I think? Yeah, verse 16. So he lived about 65 years and then he gave birth to Jared. And then verse 16, Mahalalil lived after he begat Jared 830 years and begat sons and daughters. Self-explanatory. After he gave birth to Jared, he lived about 830 years and then he gave birth to sons and daughters as well. And all the days of Mahalalil were 890 and 5 years and he died. So all the days that Mahalalil uh, lived were about 890 years, uh, 890 and 5 years and then he finally died. And Jared lived 160 and 2 years and he begat Enoch. This is extremely important now. When Jared lived about 162 years, he followed just like his ancestors and gave birth to a son. Now notice the name is full-fledged worldliness. Okay? He called him Enoch. This is full-fledged worldliness. Why? You forgot. Cain named his son what? Jared was just simply following an extremely worldly tradition, so much to the extreme to the point, I'm going to give you the exact name. Oh, wow. Now, you would think there's no hope for this guy. But look at this one. Now, I want to encourage you Christians. This is a good way to close this passage. I want to close it with Enoch right here. This is going to encourage you a lot. There's no doubt when you look at this uh, scenery and all these generations, we're following a similar pattern. There's absolutely no doubt. We're following it to a T. I mean, we're living at the timeline of Genesis 5 now. It's only a matter of time when that Noah's flood, so to speak, is about to happen. All right? The Antichrist is about to set up his kingdom. The Lord's about to unleash his seals of judgment like he did back then. So, there's no doubt about that. But in spite of, and there is no doubt that the law is, is that if you follow the world and sin, it's going to be natural that your next generation is going to be worse than you and compromise more with the world, sink in more with the world than you. But it also gives hope. The hope is, is that in spite of you living in the most wicked day and age, you can come out very surprisingly even one of the best. That should encourage you. Keep reading here. The Bible says, and Jared, verse 19, And Jared lived after he begat Enoch 800 years. So after Jared lived um, he, uh, and gave birth to Enoch 800 years, and then gave birth to sons and daughters. And all the days of Jared were 960 and 2 years, and he died. So Jared lived about 960 and 2 years, and then he passed away. Verse 29, so it's Enoch's turn now. Now let's see if he's going to follow the, his ancestors. Just like the typical normal human life, right? I'm going to live, I'm going to give birth, I'm going to live the normal human life, live the normal, uh, live the normal worldly way, get married the normal worldly way, give birth to children the normal worldly way, and then my children is going to end up like this in the normal worldly way. Oh, wow. So you notice that that was Mahalalil, Canaan, Enos, Seth. But then all of a sudden, Enoch, it was different. Keep reading here. The Bible says, and Enoch, verse 21, And Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. Notice here that he lived about sixty-five years and that he gave birth to Methuselah. He's following a pattern of his ancestors, right? The wording at verse 21 follows everything at uh, 20, 19, 18, 17. Do you see a difference? There's no difference. It's normal. Enoch is living the worldly life. 
Wait, I thought he was spiritual, a great giant. He was following the normal worldly life. He didn't walk with God until after he gave birth to Methuselah. Now, there's a rarely great sermon from Dr. Kyle Stevens about this passage. And it's extremely encouraging. And you heard that at our blowout too. Right. Yeah, that was a really good sermon. You know what he pointed out here? Some of you are discouraged. You're living at a wicked worldly day and age. And you think that, oh, I'm just going to follow the wicked worldly life. I'm not like the great days of the great revival and the apostles and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. No, actually, you'll notice here that um, Enoch, he lived the worldly life just like you. The normal life like you. Until he gave birth to a son. Look at verse 22. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 Amen. years and begat sons and daughters. See, Enoch started to walk with God. He started to take his quote-unquote Christian life, Christian walk seriously after he gave birth to a son. Uh, 300 years he lived uh, after he gave birth to that son and then he gave birth to sons and daughters. How about that? I think there's hope for you. There's hope for you. There's hope for you. So, notice that uh, after he gave birth to Methuselah, it's about 300 years, and then he had to uh, live for the Lord. But as Dr. Kyle Stevens uh, pointed out, is that, you know, Enoch, he lived just like you guys, where after he gave birth to children, can you imagine how busy you are? So it's so hard to read the Bible, pray, go to church, do all these great things. I'm not like Pastor Kim and etc. Hey, Enoch, uh, he, you don't see here he planted missions. He just walked with God. You notice here he didn't do, have some kind of great awakening revival with thousands saved or huge church building. No, he just walked with God. He just lived like you. And it wasn't until after he gave birth to children he started to live right for the Lord. And guess what? That was enough for God to rapture him. Oh. Isn't that encouraging? Amen! Now think about it. There's no other per there is absolutely no other person in the entire Bible. Think about this. No other person in the entire Bible you can think of that had that privilege and honor except one person, Enoch. Wow. Except him. That's something. Not even Jesus. You know that? Not even the Lord God Almighty. You know why? The Lord God Almighty tasted death for every man when he didn't have to. Okay, you feeling a little encouraged? So, you know, stop whining and sucking your thumb. Just get back to work and serve God. I know you sinned yesterday night, but just come back to church, all right? All right, look half decent at least, you know, rather than that you've just been smoking marijuana or going high yesterday night. Just clean yourself up, make yourself decent for church, at least half decent, and then bring a Bible with you, and then come to church, and then just look at the Word of God. That's Amen. it. Amen, it's that simple. Just get back to work. And then, so what? You sin again, then you just repent, get right with God, and come back again. Did you forget uh, last week's memory verse? Uh, what we're supposed to forgive our fellow brother is seven times a day. Yeah. And then if he says, I repent, God says, you're supposed to forgive him. Now, if a fellow human being is supposed to do that, how much more your God, yeah. who is greater in forgiveness than humans? Wow. That's the reason why you guys had to memorize that verse, to encourage you. You might say, why? Why did you do that, Pastor? Because I needed that verse. More than you, I needed that verse. Shocking, huh? Oh, I'm not like you, Pastor, and oh, if only you would know. If only you would know what God had to take me out from and what he had to pull me through. See, we, uh, when we talk about Enoch, ooh, great spiritual giant, but you just don't know how normal he was like you. All right, going back to the text, uh, we see here that Enoch, he walked with God. Now, there's no doubt that Enoch, while he was walking with the Lord, he did everything he could to serve him. If we keep reading here, and all the days of Enoch were 360 and 5 years. So all the timeline of Enoch was about uh, 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. So Enoch, he just kept walking with God like you're doing. Oh, you know, I need to learn this, I need to do that. There's so much talk, there's so much work to do at church. No, just walk with God. Just do what you're doing. Just read the Bible. Just pray. Just come to church. 
And then, you know, whenever soul winning's open, try it out. We even have a soul winning class. Try it out. Onliners, we have the discipleship playlist. Try it out. I mean, how many years have you heard about it and you never even tried and you're so discouraged, oh, I can't do much for the Lord, when you didn't even try the small things for two, three years? Amen. Encourage you. I mean, you know why? You make light of those little things. That's why. You know what God says? Who despised the day of small things? It was that little stone the Lord used to kill a giant. Amen. So, you know, the Lord, He uses the little things. Don't take light of those little things. Take those little things. They become very powerful things that turn into big things. Triple amen. They turn into big things. One little raindrop, you know, if you give it a lot of time, it can turn into a dangerous huge flood, a mighty flood. Okay, let's go back here. Let's go back. So we see that Enoch, he just kept walking with the Lord. But he was not available, you notice, all right? Uh, we'll come back to that part later. But let's talk about uh, Enoch here. And, oh, time flies. Stop, okay? Uh, I can't continue on. And, you know, I actually forgot to expound chapter 4, verse 26. You know, it just dawned on me. So, uh, next Genesis study, I'll expound what chapter 4, verse 26 means. Uh, it's, there was no polytheism that time. It was monotheism. But they were still wicked. What was really going on back then? All right, that'll be next Genesis study. And then this one, uh, we're going to, I'm going to encourage you about some things about uh, Enoch, you know, what he did. We're going to talk about the book of Enoch as well, you know. A lot of people think that's scripture, but it's not. So I'm going to show you about that one. And then also the secret to how you can get raptured a little sooner if you want that. We can learn it from Enoch. All right, wait till next Sunday, all right? I'll see you at church. Okay. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for salvation through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, uh, what a blessed book. Uh, we just don't learn from history, don't we, Lord? Uh, we're just very stupid human creatures. And I pray that we've learned something from this teaching and be encouraged that there's something that we can do for you in spite of a wicked day and age. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.